Good evening, everyone. It's Friday night, and we're continuing our Friday night Bible study. We are in um, First Chronicles, the 13th chapter, the exciting chapter. At the same time, uh, the drama and the saga continues uh, with now David as king. And so as we're looking to here, we'll see some things that we are able to glean from that. At the same time, if you have any questions or comments, uh, you can post them on the comment section of our uh, live stream. Also, uh, if you um, have any questions uh, that you'd like to email us, you can email us online at cbc1620 at att.net or you can go to our website www.cbcsr.org and there's a place there for, to be able to email us and even also prayers if you want to email us prayer requests uh, certainly do that we want to continue to be in prayer for all of those uh, our world actually who's dealing with this coronavirus but specifically those uh, locally and especially our churches we are men together and so we're gathering we're using technology together and so what a blessing what a time that we can be able to gather together uh, on the uh, using the technology and social media to be able to do those things Kind of some specific prayers. Want to keep the Rogers family in your prayers at the loss of a family member. Uh, we want to do that. And uh, others, um, the walkers, the, you know, a lot of our congregants who are just um, stressing, and a lot of people who are stressing right now over the coronavirus. We're trying to do our part. We're trying to better do our part. We sent out a message today asking people not to come to the church different for a Baptist preacher to do that uh, because preachers like people in seats and some amens when we go along doing our Bible study. But, uh, so we'll do it this way until this is over. This too shall pass. Uh, we have to remember that as we begin our lesson. And also we want to thank those who continue to give to the cause of Christ and the expansion of the kingdom of God. Uh, if you'd like to send a donation there's a way to send donations on our website, www.cbcsr.org, on the donation. We're still um, doing some ministries here, uh, uh, not only here, but around the world. And so they need our help also. Uh, people are calling, still needing, and so we're still trying to provide what we can. And it's your conscientious giving, tithing, and contributions that helps that happen. So we want to thank you as you continue to do those things. You can mail them in. There's a place on our website to pay for it, uh, to pay uh, PayPal to put the money in also, uh, your tithes and your offerings. So we just thank you for that as we prepare now to get into our lesson. Uh, we'll have a scripture reading and then a prayer and then we'll Okay, I'll be reading Psalm 61. Hear, O God, my cry, listen to my prayer. From the earth's end I call to you as my heart grows faint. You will set me high upon a rock, you will give me rest, for you are my refuge, a tower of strength against the enemy. Oh, that I might lodge in your tent forever, take refuge in the shelter of your wings. You indeed, O God, have accepted my vows. You granted me the heritage of those who fear your name. Add to the days of the king's life. Let his years be many generations. Let him sit enthroned before God forever. Bid kindness and faithfulness preserve him. So will I sing the praises of your name forever, fulfilling my vows day by day. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, first of all, we do praise, 
honor and glory to you. Thank you for this time and for spending your word, Lord. Open up our hearts to receive your word, Lord, that it may uh, glorify you and as we get the understanding of your will in our lives, Lord, and the direction you want us to go. Uh, we just pray that uh, you will have the Holy Spirit minister to our hearts, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord, that we can get comfort and joy from your word, Lord. We pray for all those uh, in the country going through this epidemic, Lord. We pray for their safety, Lord. And we just trust in you, Lord. And, and uh, so as we study your word, Lord, we ask for your blessings. We give you the glory, honor, and uh, praise. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. And that's uh, our staff. These are staff members who are helping, who are doing this, helping the technical portion of Please call, let us know beforehand so that we can like deal with it either over the phone or uh, deal with it um, as you come in. At least we'll know. So we're looking at First Chronicles chapter 13. Um, we can look at uh, some of the religious policies of David. It's a parallel, some parallel passages in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses. One at least through seven. I think it goes a little further than that, maybe down to eleven or something. But um, this is David attempting to bring in the bring the ark back to uh, Jerusalem, uh, and we can see that. And I say attempting because the one thing I want us to remember is, you know, in uh, Joshua. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you serve the God of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Egyptians, or whatever? Full list of names. He said, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Which might sound like a, a real a nice uh, hard line to do, but for a leader giving a national speech like that, uh, it's tough. He was showing that other entities had already slipped in. Other um, ideologies had come along. And so, as we look in here, we can see David is now king of Israel. And last chapter, we talked a little bit about it, uh, him being king. And he's just trying to develop his team. We talked about that last week. Developing a team around him is important. And now, David is said in verse 1, and David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. So now uh, we see David here uh, first uh, consulting. And when it talks about the captains of thousands, a lot of times, uh, you know, it, it, it could be uh, political people, his, his, his local, uh, the, the, the local rulers that he assigned to different regions or whatever it might be. Uh, it's not so much military, but also, uh, you know, like a, a mayor is a mayor of a city, and a governor is a governor of a state and like that. So uh, it can also mean that. And then uh, it says, and, and it says with every leader. So he's talking to captains. He's talking with every leader consulting. And here's what, and, then, and David said unto all the congregation of Israel, if it seem good unto you that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere that are left in all, that are left in all the land of Israel. And with them also to the priests and the Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves to us and let us bring uh, again the ark of God, ark of our God to us. 
for we inquired not in the days of Saul. And so David is trying to do a wonderful thing. David is trying to bring back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And, 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 and this Ark, you know, the Ark is not a, it has a lot of importance to it. One, uh, you know, the ark is, was made of the finest materials. Uh, you know, it's great. Uh, a lot of gold. And, I mean, it was, God's the one who told them how to make the ark of the covenant. And then uh, it, was, uh, it was placed, a place of atonement. It's a place where the atonement had taken place. And uh, so it was placed, it was housed in the holiest of holies. It was housed not in the holy place, not in the outer areas of the tabernacle, but in the holiest of holies. And so that's where the Ark of the Covenant belonged and what it represented, because it was always in the center, even when they traveled, they traveled with the Ark and, and the priests and the Levites and all of those who had to do anything with the tent tabernacle that they were carrying uh, they were in the center they were surrounded by the other tribes the, uh, and so when they traveled and it represented God in the center of our nation and it's important that you have God in the center of your nation not only in your nation but your house and that's what God housed he houses in the center of your heart we are the temple God. So God, I mean, individually, yes, he's housed in the very center of who we are. And so we are thankful that uh, we have a God who is relational with us. And look, that was God's connection to uh, a holy God's connection to a sinful man. In his way, now not only was it uh, a place in the holiest of holies, but the key role was on the Day of Atonement. And uh, you can find that in Leviticus 16 and 14. Let me go there and see. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 14. And it says, and he shall take the blood of, a, of the bullock and sprinkle it upon his finger and upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. And so that mercy seat is what he's talking about, the mercy seat. And uh, in verse 16, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them and in the midst of their uncleanliness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of congregation when he goeth to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household for all the congregation of Israel. And so it represented that, that not only that uh, the place of the holiest of holies where it was housed, but also it represented that place that on the Day of Atonement, once a year, the Day of Atonement, and they would go in and they would, uh, God would forgive them, he would uh, atone for their sins for another year. They had to do this every year. And, and, and that's a difference between Christ because Christ died once for all. They had to bring a lamb in every once a year, an unblemished lamb, sprinkle the blood on him, high priest go in, sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant, 
the Shekinah glory come down, atone for sins for another year. Uh, but we don't have, we have for all eternity now. When we're saved now, we're saved for all eternity. But we, when God forgives, he forgives for all eternity. We don't have to come back year after year. We don't have to come back with animal sacrifices and all of that. And thank God because uh, this, uh, and this was God's way of doing things. And don't forget that. It's always about doing the things God's way. And so we see here, David wants to do a great thing. He wants to bring the ark back to its rightful place in the land of Israel. And so, or Jerusalem. And uh, so he, and verse 4, in verse 3, let us bring again the ark of our God to us. For we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. So they never talked about it. You remember the Philistines had captured it at one time. And, and I mean, it, it, this ark was just uh, in a place where it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, matter of fact, one, at one time the Philistines had it. And they were such bad things happening that they didn't make kind of puts it off on somebody else and they didn't want it either because <laughs> it had a purpose everything God has has a purpose and so uh, here we are now where David wants to bring it back to its rightful place and that, that's not a bad thing it's not a bad thing at all that's we want Christ to be in the rightful place uh, uh, in our life we want him to be seated on the throne of our life as Lord. He's Lord. And so, and all the congregation said that they would do so, verse 4, so the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Don't miss that. All the congregations, the captains, the Levites, everybody he consulted. Everybody said, yay, let's do this. David gathered all Israel together from Shinar, from Shior of Egypt, even unto the entering of Hemet, to bring the ark of God from Kerjath-Jearim. And so now he gathered people to go and get the ark. David went up in all of Israel to Baal, that is, Kirjath Jearim, which belonged to Judah, and to bring thence the ark of God, the Lord, that dwelleth between the cherubims, whose name is called on it. See, between the cherubim, the mercy seat, between the cherubim, Wings spread together, uh, uh, facing heads bowed, wings together, mercy seat, right there. God, it said right there. And in other scriptures, uh, it lets us know. When we look at Isaiah 37, 16, it talks about he dwelleth between the cherubims. In Psalms 80 and 2, it says that he, he dwells between the cherubims. And so, uh, whose name is called who is our God. At that time, that's where they would do business with God. That's where they would meet God. The high priest, the high priest would go into the holiest of holies, sprinkle the blood of the Lamb on the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and God's Shekinah glory. That's where God, heaven and earth would connect, divine and earth would connect, and that's uh, what that was all about. And so, you know, it, it was an amazing thing for God Almighty to be concerned with people. And God is concerned with people. And so, Jesus is our great high priest. He's already been into the holiest of holies. He's the, the lamb uh, who, uh, who was slain from before the, uh, the uh, building of the world. And so, uh, before the foundation of the world. And so, here is 
Now, David, excited, excited. Seven, and they carried the ark in a new cart, right? Forget that. Mistake number one. Out of the house of Benadad, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the car. Um, and David and Israel played before God with all their might, with the singing, with the harps with the psalteries, with the timbrels, with the cymbals, and the trumpets. They were worshiping God. Isn't that exciting? Worshiping God. The Ark of the Covenant on the cart. They're bringing it home. Woo! Great yeah. time. What a great time we're about to have in the Lord. And then, at the foot of their worship, incident happened. And, uh, and when they had come, verse 9, when they had come to the threshing floor of Kaidan, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark for the oxen stumbled. For the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark and there he died before God. Wow. All that worship, all that praise, everything going on, excitement. Oh, we bring the thing back. Number one, we have to remember when he consulted all the people, did it say anywhere that where he had consulted God? See, you consult everybody you want to, but if you don't consult God, because again, we're not here. God's not there to do our will. We're here to do God's will. So you can't do it your way. He put this thing on, an, on a new, a brand new car. Put it in a new car. Probably the, uh, <laughs> probably the limousine of cars. Uh, but when you look at Numbers. Uh, chapter 7, verse 9. Here's what it says. Numbers chapter 7, verse 9. And unto the sons of Kohath, he gave none because the service of the sanctuary belonging unto them, but they should bear it, bear upon their shoulders. Okay. So, everybody had their job. But the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be carried by men on their shoulders. Not be, it, it not, it, it, you know, we're always trying to find ways of doing things easy. Right? A lot of our inventions come because people try to, we've done, learn to do things easy. We get tired, we get in a hurry, right? We have microwave stuff now because we want to quick, fast, in a hurry, and it's easy. We don't want to cook and prepare meals anymore because if they're already, if it's already back, it's, it's easy. And so, with God, I'm not saying it's hard, but, but we have to do it God's way. So I don't care what kind of new thing you build. He might have built a whole new, he built a whole new car that's probably really, really, really nice. Had all the latest features that cars could have in those days. Might have had spinners and <laughs> shocks and everything else, you know. But the oxen stumbled. And when the guy, all he did was try to stop the ark from falling. But God, 
it says his anger was kindled. Why would God be so mad at somebody for trying to um, stop the ark from falling? Because if they would have done it the right way, there probably wouldn't have been any stumbling. See, the other thing we'll find, and as we go into, we'll see in the 15th chapter, David finally gets it right. He'll finally prepare the thing like it's supposed to be prepared. You have to prepare first. He didn't even prepare a place. They just went and got, oh, it'd be nice to have an ark. Let's just go get it. Nothing prepared. Let's just go get it. Uh, not God's way, our way. Right? So, it's not how you do it for God. How you do it for God is more important than just getting the job done. How you do it for God is more important than just getting the job done. And so uh, we can see here that God's anger, the anger of the Lord was kindled against us. He smote him. In other words, he killed him. Um, because even the Levites were forbidden to touch the ark on the threat of death. And so this was, he broke this, he broke it. Uh, when we look at the case of the Philistines handling the ark, they were killed because of their ignorance of the law. So in 1 Samuel 6 and 7, uh, even the Philistines, because they didn't know. Hey, I didn't know. Ignorance is no excuse, right? How many people are going to be standing before God one day and say, I didn't know. We've been teaching the gospel. We've been preaching about Jesus, telling people to tell people about Jesus, all of that. And they want to take the chance of standing before a holy God and say, I didn't know. I mean, <laughs> uh, what? You know, it's too late. So I'm trying to share with you, you need to know. You need to be clear. It's not about our way. You can't plan your way to heaven. You didn't create heaven nor earth. Matter of fact, about the only thing that we made here is trouble. <laughs> you know, I mean, God gets us out of that. He fixes us out of that. And I'm thankful that we have a God who's able to do that. So it's not about your way or my way. It's all about God's way. And listen, I understand during these times, people say, well, you know, God is going to protect me. Yeah, he, he's trying to, right? He gives us ways of being protected. Now, he gave us, like, you know, when you get sick before, you know, you wouldn't, you know, unless you were just, a little bit maybe fanatical or just maybe didn't believe that way. You just say, okay, well, you know, God will fix it. And then people died behind that. Or you can go to the hospital, the ministry of medicine, which God has prepared for us if it's done right. He's got it in his plants, his herbs, his things that we can do. I mean, he had healing waters. People could drink water and be healed. Moses had, had, had uh, the golden image here, uh, that golden calf here, uh, refined, he ground down to a real fine powder and, and put it in the water. And they say when you refine gold that fine and you put it in the water, the water turns red and people drink it and they live. And that's all they had to do was drink the water. But, you know, people don't want to do that. So God gives us ways of doing things, but we have to do it his way. And then we act surprised with God's anger. And then say, uh, and then there's the other side to it also. Where we'll say, well, you know, everything's going good, so I must be doing something right because God is blessing me. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, Satan can make things happen too. As we read Revelation, we see he has power, he governs, he has systems. So he can raise you up in the system and you'll think it's God. If you don't know the difference, you'll think it's God. 
but it's Satan. And so we need to, because he's, the Bible says he's crafty. He didn't stop being crafty just because we're in America and we're in this time now and, and everything looks real, you know, prosperous or did at one time. It's, it's, it still is. It's still there. Opportunity's still here. We just have to know and, and we have to go through these times right now. But I'm saying um, we have to remember that it, we have to do it God's way. And uh, so and so here he is now, Kendall against Uzzah. And then David had the nerve, verse 11, was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David uh, it says that David was displeased, deeply moved. He was sad uh, because of what the Lord had done, struck Uzzah so violently, and uh, because of the Lord's outburst of wrath against Uzzah, the place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Now, I don't know if it's just to remind them that God is still in control or is it to remind them of, uh, uh, that God sometimes gets displeased. You think that God is pleased with us all the time? You think that God still don't get angry? I mean, that's, you know, again, in the gospel message, Paul put it like this. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Romans 1, 16. For it's the power of God unto salvation to those who believe, to the Jew first and to the Greek. That was his ministry. And he says, for in it is the righteousness of wrath, the righteousness of God revealed. And the just shall live by faith. Right? And then it says, and the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. So in the gospel message is the is the uh, is the um, the uh, God's grace and his mercy talks about in there for the righteousness of God and his wrath. What's the wrath? The wrath is revealed against all unrighteousness. And so God's anger is still under all unrighteousness. That's the gospel message. Read it for yourself. Psalm, uh, Romans 1, 16, 17, maybe even 18, but I know it's at least those two. But it's in there. For the righteousness and the wrath of God. Both. That's the full gospel message. He poured his wrath out on Jesus on the cross. That's the full gospel message. When God uh, 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 struck Put all the sins upon Jesus. Say that he became sin for us. And in the end, he died. Because the wages of sin is death. But he wasn't an atonement for our sins. He saved us from our sins and from the wrath of God. See, now it's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. However, I need to exemplify some kind of righteousness in my life. You know, faith without works is dead. And what that means is that you can't just tell me you believe something and act like you don't. Right? Uh, my, uh, I used to have an auntie who would always say, yeah, red is green. <laughs> Red's not green. But when somebody was just saying some crazy stuff, she'd say, yeah, red is green. What I'm saying is, we have to do. If red is red, red is red everywhere. If green is green, green is green everywhere. So we have to be able to um, do and know. We have to know God's word, what it says, and be able to practice it. Now, it's not that we practice it and we do these things because to get to heaven. I, Christ 
has already paid the price. But because of his love for us, we want to do the things that pleases God. It ought to be something in you that wants you to do what God wants you to do. It ought to be something driving you that wants, that just you just want to just line up with God. We can't be perfect. Our only perfection is Christ in us. But to live the life, the Christ-like life, you can't go after any and everything that's in this world. We have to change our thinking. We have to, that's what he says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We have to change our thinking. We're, 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 we're a new creation. We're a new creature in Christ. Something has to change. If it's changing on the inside, it ought to reflect on the outside. Now, it don't change all at once. But, it, you know, it's kind of like an onion. It peels away layers. It's this layer and that layer. And, and let me say this. If you just lie, if you just practice doing God's will, you'll see stuff peel away and, you, and it's just gone. But at the same time, uh, we have an enemy who knows how to stir that stuff up in us. So that's the war that we have going on in us. God's given us the victory over that war. David, at this point, he lost that particular war because he wanted to do it his way. He did not consult God. He consulted everybody else, his leaders, his politicians, his captains, his military, the congregation. Everybody was in agreement except he didn't talk to God. The same thing happened to Joshua in the seventh chapter. After they had done this great battle with Jericho, Ooh, that man, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down, the first entry into the promised land, splitting the north from the south, very strategic place. And here they are, man, man, we, we're in. Look at God. That was it. Look at God. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. And then in the seventh chapter, he forgot to consult God against a small brand of people, and he, and he sent out a small number, and they came back running with their tails between their legs over a small band of people because he didn't consult God. Because of what Achan had done, one man messed it up for, for everybody else. If he had asked God first, he would have found that. And so it's the same thing. David did not ask God first. So now Uzzah is dead. And uh, then, and God's wrath is kindled against Uzzah. David was displeased. And then David was afraid of God that day. Now he's getting, he's getting, he's getting in the right place. And then there's a healthy fear. You know, you know, people say, well, that means reverence, but you know, uh, then what I must have been doing is reverencing my parents when they said, boy, if you go out and that, if you chase that ball out in the street and I see you, then you're gonna pay a price. That's reverence. Then that's what I'm doing. What I'm saying. There's a healthy fear. God puts a healthy fear in us. And, and the Bible says the, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We ought to fear God, not in us. I mean, yes, we ought to be afraid to know that God is not pleased or God, we're not doing God's will. But also at the same time, we ought to be. Uh, it's not, it, 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 it's a healthy fear. And, and as long as we stay in that healthy fear, we're okay. Because joy can come and because we can gain his favor. We'll be blessed, even though, but it, it's, it's a fear of the Lord. In other words, you ought to be afraid to do anything apart from God. And so, David was afraid. Um, and he said, how can how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? How can I harbor the ark of God after this? See, now he's starting to ask some questions. Man, God, but God had to do that. Look at what happened. God did it and God gave his attention. How many of us have a short attention span with God? You have to have a, a, a good attention span with God. So God has a way of getting our attention. And, and you know, I, I know that you know we're going through all of this, but I can't wait until this passes. 
Because I'm going to tell you right now, I can just see this church full of people being so glad to get back and service and fellowship and with one another in this house. So sometimes, you know, you don't miss your water till your well is dry. The well is dry right now a little bit. Amen. So the water's coming. But we just have to wait on the Lord. He's getting our attention. And so we see here now uh, it says, so David brought the ark not David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it to carried it aside to the house of Obed Edom the Gittite. Now uh, he didn't worry about getting it back uh, home. He just wanted to get it someplace, and and this Obed Edom. It's the first time he's mentioned in the Bible. Uh, you know, at David's first attempt to uh, move the ark. So the ark stayed there three months. But, oh, there must have been something about Obed-Edom. Must have been something about him that was godly. Must have been, he must have had some faith. He must have understood some things about God and his art and trusted in him uh, and not breaking his command. Because look at what it said. Uh, and he took the ark of God and the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in the house three months and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that it had. Everything that they owned, the whole household prospered. God blessed the house of Obed-Edom. The ark was there. Obed must have knew, I don't just touch this thing. This is God's, uh, we have to do this God's way. I can't do it my way. I can't just take the things. I, you can praise and jump and worship and shout all you want. That's what they were doing, jumping and shouting on that cart, right? That's what they were doing. The ark is on the cart. They pray. They got all the music. Oh, we work. They be worshiping God now. So many times we look around. People are good on worship, but lousy on obedience. And so we have to get better at obedience, and our worship will automatically get better. See, when you do God's will, when you continue to talk to God and walk with him and study his word, find out about who he is, find out about what he wants, find out about how he wants us to be his purpose that he made for us, then you begin to truly live the Christ-like life. He gave us all something to do for him. We were made for his purpose, not the other way around. Some people want to call up God like a genie, rub a, a magic lamp. Oh, God, can you come and, and see about it? And all God is ever saying, well, why don't you come and uh, have a little talk with me sometime? Mm -hmm. We get to talk to God, but trouble has a way of reminding us that, wait a minute, I need to talk to the Lord. And so uh, it's just a reminder to us that God sets the agenda for his worship. You don't just worship God in your way. Oh, Lord. I, you know, this is a true thing. We have to be careful even how we worship God. He said, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You have to watch how you praise God. When you praise God. Where you praise God. You know, I know we can, we can walk around with a praise in our heart, and I get that. But, I mean, I'm not going to be at the club praising God. Oh, God, make it happen. God, I know it's going to come around this time. God, oh, hallelujah. I'm going to say a prayer. You all up in the club dancing. Hey, I got my Holy Ghost praise on. I don't think so. <laughs> and summertime, sometimes you can't tell the difference between the songs in the church and the songs in the club. Now, I know I've got people are getting a little, but I'm telling you the truth. Worshiping God, we really need to be careful. There are certain songs 
that, that, that causes us to remember certain sinful incidents. It was, hey, that's my song. Y'all know that one? I know you do. <laughs> yeah. Probably some people say, yeah, I know that one. <laughs> Every time they come on, ooh, that's my song. But that song had a sinful meaning connected to it. So you can take and put new lyrics on the same old music. You think the feeling's going to change? No, that's what I'm talking about. We have to be careful. It, God, when we look at Revelation, he said, and they sung a new song. Why? Because them old songs don't work. Now, I know there's some that's good, some that have been prayed about, some that have come through the crucible of, of God's of faith. But some are just trying to get your money. And so, uh, so he has to be worshipped. The way he requires to be worshipped, not what we. Uh, and so uh, they tried to manipulate God to meet their own ends. Uh, David and his people, again, they had to realize that they served God and God, not vice versa. Uh, so the Lord is the commander of the army. And I remember when uh, Joshua also, before entering Jericho, uh, the Lord visited him. And he said, who's that? He came out there, he had his uh, sword or something like that. He came out and he said, whose side are you on? Are you on my side or are you on their side? And he said, well, neither. And he then realized that I'm not on neither side. You need to be on my side. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be on your side or their side. Whoever needs to be on my side. And so we have to remember that, uh, you know, God cares for people who submit uh, to him, to submit their life to him. But they found out here that If you don't, uh, you're God's foe. And so how do you how do you fight God? How do you plan to win? What's your what's your what's your war strategy to win a war against God? I mind the story of some guys saying, okay. God, we're going to see who can do this thing better. And they got the best, best scientific minds together. And uh, so they said, okay, we're going to make a better uh, whatever. Whatever they're going to make, a better tree, a better whatever. So God said, okay. So they went and grabbed some dirt. And God said, oh, that's my dirt. You can't, they went and got some water. Nope, can't use my water. That's my water. <laughs> everything they try to do, you have to go to God because he created everything. So, and he created us. And we, we, we were created to do his will. And so, uh, you know, the thing that we need to say is, yes, Lord. Peter one time tried to say, no, Lord. And those two words don't even go together. That's like oil and water trying to mix it up. If he's your Lord, he's yes. If he's not your Lord, then it's just no. It's no, no, Lord. It's just no. You know. So um, now we see that, that, that David, the Ark of the Covenant is in place, Obed-Edom, uh, in his house, three months, they're blessed. They must have been doing things God's way while David uh, did not consult with God. I don't know how Obed-Edom got to this point, but he did something right in the sight of the Lord. We'll see later how God blessed him. Not only the three months, but God continued to bless him because he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And here's the king. Here's some priest, a man who has a house in a 
a certain place, and here's uh, David, the king, with all his counsel, the best counsel. He was cursed. This man was blessed. And we have to remember, the Bible also is filled with curses and blessings, right? When we look at it, we see people cursed. Oh, they were happy at one time. Boom. Other curse, right? And it was bound for him to be cursed because they wasn't doing it right in the first place. And so here's Obed Edom. All of a sudden, now he's uh, blessed <laughs> because he must be doing something right with the Lord. And let me say this we all have the blessing of the Lord. There's a lot of other scripture. Goes along with this, but, but here's the point. We're here to serve the Lord. And in that service, we're here to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Share a living word to a dying world. Share the gospel. It's not a request, it's a command. Bible calls it, you know, the Great Commission. But it's it's a command. We have to go around and tell people about Jesus. Tell them about how good he's been to you. Tell them about what he's done for you. And then continue to build testimony with them. But when you tell somebody, especially in these times, it's a good time to tell somebody about Jesus. People are worried. They're stressing. Coronavirus, I know it's, it's a, it, and I'm not diminishing it at all, please. I'm not. But I'm saying that people are really facing some trials and some tribulations right now. And they need hope. And, and where are they going to get hope from? Can't get it from our government? Nobody has the answer. This is not, somebody said, well, you know, we, we don't. Uh, our county is doing this, that, and the other. But this thing don't care about counties. It doesn't care about culture, custom, country, or race. It doesn't care about that. Virus is hitting every people group around the world. So I'm saying that because it's the same thing with sin and, and not receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior. God is not a respecter of persons. He's not going to look at you one day standing before a holy God with the book of your life open. And you can have all this good stuff. Oh, I did this. You know, I gave all my money and Charity and, and uh, you know, I have to, you know, speak with the tongues like uh, men and angels and uh, gave my body to be burned. Yet, if you don't have Christ, it means nothing. Because in the eternal scheme of things, it's all about Jesus. And so it starts by not only, if you, not only telling somebody about Jesus, but if you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you should do that right now. It's a good time to receive Jesus. It's a good time to go tell somebody you know. Matter of fact, right after we get done, call somebody you know. Uh, and please, just because you're saved, don't, 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 don't peel away all your sinner friends. Because you have to be a witness to them. You're going to be the one that they're going to say, wow, their life changed. Or, I want what you have. You know? And you're going to be out the one to tell them about Jesus. And so tell them about Jesus. Tell them about what he's done for you. How he's changed your life. Tell them those things. Tell them about how he died on the cross for our sin. How his blood was shed on Calvary's hill. How he was nailed in his hands and nailed in his feet to an old rugged cross. How he hung his head gave up the ghost. He died. And 
on the third day, as the scripture said. He got up from the grave with all power in his hand. All power by heaven and earth. All power in his hand. The power to give us eternal life. And, and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's what it says in Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 9. And the reason that's so important is because in those days, you could be killed for confessing Jesus with your mouth. So you better believe it in your heart. Same condition exists today. You could be eternally damned. All you have to do is open your heart to him today. That's all. Now tell him that. Open your heart to Jesus. Open your heart. Just pray with somebody. Just have a prayer with him. Open your heart to Jesus. Give him your heart today. Give him your life. If this is all that's gotten you in your best thinking to this point now, you need Jesus anyway. If you're in a place of hopelessness, uh, you need Jesus anyway. If you think that you know everything is against you right now, you need Jesus. You need some victory. And so ask him to come into your heart today. I want to thank you for listening today, but then share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's important. Through all of this, the, the important thing is we share Jesus with somebody. He's real. He lived. I don't serve a dead Savior. I don't serve somebody carved out of wood or, or some metal object or even some creature, right? A spider, a snake, or whatever. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's all about a living Savior. And so, I want to thank you for being here. I hope that this helped you uh, in our lesson today of First Chronicles chapter 13. Do things God's way and not yours, and you'll be okay. Everything. Now, I, don't, I didn't say you wouldn't have trouble. But everything will turn out all right. But you have to do it God's way and not your way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for allowing us to be here. We thank you for this word, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, all that you're going to do for us. Oh, Lord, we can look to you. Uh, like the psalmist said one time. Where he says, I look to the hills. And, and the hills seem to be filled with lions and tigers and bears or thieves or curves or troubles or trials. And when I looked at those hills, I had a question. Where's my help going to come from? And the answer came, my help is from the Lord. And so God, let people continue to understand now, even though there's trouble going on, my help is in the Lord. In the midst of all the trials, the tribulations, the turbulent times, our help is from the Lord. He's still worthy of all of our praise. He's still God. We still have to do it his way. God, help us to pray more. Help us to read more of your word. Help us to develop more in our Christian walk with you. Help us to decide that we're going to serve you more as soon as this thing passes. And let it be a, a mantra. Let it be, let it be our, 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 our mission to serve you more right where we're at. Through your church, the body of believers, and we give you all the praise and glory. I want to pray for all those who are out there and pray for all those who are here. And we pray this in the strong and mighty name of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. And thank God. God bless you. God thank you. And have a great uh, rest of your evening. Any questions, don't forget to text us or whatever. Uh, God bless.